Careful what you say. You're taking names. <laughs> All right, uh, welcome everyone. We're to our November uh, Canandaigua Lake uh, TU uh, monthly meeting. We're doing our third hybrid meeting, I think. So we're getting a little better at that. We got some new hardware here and cameras. Um, so uh, thanks to everyone. We got six people online and, uh, and how, oh geez, a whole bunch in here, a dozen or so, right? <laughs> so uh, thanks for coming out tonight. Uh, I think we got a really, uh, I think interesting program. And so without further ado, let's uh, go through what we usually do here. We, let's see, as soon as my screen starts responding, there we go. So um, this is what, we'll, what we usually do, um, have a kind of an opening thing. We'll do our Pledge of Allegiance, show you some fish pictures and reports, uh, some uh, quick uh, updates on the chapter's business. And then we'll get into the main events, which are, we have two programs tonight. Um, you know, have some uh, really great bunch of guests here tonight, our uh, students and teachers from Marcus Whitman High School. Uh, we're going to talk about their really the uh, Trout in the Classroom program we're running there. It's the first time our chapters got involved in this program, and, and it really uh, came together quickly and, and really well. And, uh, and uh, let's see, Dave DiCarlo just uh, came in. And then uh, Ralph is going to uh, talk about... Uh, uh, an environmental issue that affects <laughs> fishing here, uh, which is where have all the insects gone. And um, so uh, we always like to start our meetings with a pledge of allegiance. So please uh, rise, remove your hats. And, uh, and this is an honor. Uh, Friday, of course, is Veterans Day. And uh, thank all of you. I know some of Max and some other folks are, are veterans. And Max is one a member of the Legion, allows us to meet here. So. Um, uh, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. So, um, so we always like to start off with, with some fish pictures and, um, and uh, reports. Um, so I, I'm bragging here. I caught this guy... Um, Saturday, uh, went fishing with a friend of mine on Sandy Creek um, in Monroe County, and uh, this was, if you remember, Sunday or excuse me, Friday night. We had about two inches of rain, so it was like I was watching the uh, USGS gauges like every hour to see, okay, how bad is this going to be, and is it going to be blown out? But uh, it turned out to be a really good day. The river had been really low. I went out there two weeks ago, and it was you know, it's like ankle deep. So uh, the flow was actually really nice. It was muddy, but uh, we saw several fish, landed this one, I hooked another one, and so I had a, a great day there. So this is the time of year when you get these uh, trophy sized fish uh, in these lake, uh, Great Lake tributaries around here. And um, this particular river, Sandy Creek, it's only 45 minutes or so from here. So it's a really close place where you can really get into these monstrous fish. This was kind of an average size one, which was about that big. So just to, to show you, um, there are the students that are raising the trout in the aquarium. This is how big these these guys can get. Hey, Mike, how are you doing? Hey, Hi, Richard. <laughs> so um, and then this picture I pulled off uh, Facebook from a friend of mine. Uh, this was Oak Orchard Creek, which uh, I usually don't participate in fishing when it's this close quarters, but it's, uh, I, I like the foliage shot here, uh, but you see how busy that, that place gets, um, but people come from actually all over the country to fish in these streams in Ontario, so uh, uh, it, like I said, this is the time of year you want to get out there, and weather permitting, uh, you can get a shot at, at some of these big fish. Now that we started to get some rain, it should only improve. Okay, here's some more photos. Uh, this is uh, a Jim Drone. This is at our uh, October tree planting event, and he was one of the volunteer cooks. Uh, they fed us well. And Ralph will talk a little bit about that event coming up, but we had a really good time and, and ate well, as you can see. And then um, uh, Tyler put this on his Facebook post today. He was in, he's in Washington State with his friend Steve, and uh, they were uh, chartered a uh, a guide, I think it's either the Columbia River or one of its tributaries, but they went sturgeon fishing 
and you can see he did pretty good. And these are amazing fish. They're like almost prehistoric. Um, so uh, they had a good time. Great picture of them. <laughs> yeah, that's a, a wild kind of picture. Tyler's always good for the photos. He's always <laughs> he's very photogenic. And then um, here are some photos. This was a really nice event in uh, down in the Delaware River near Deposit. Um, Adina uh, organized this uh, Women of TU event. And uh, this is our good friend Lisa, who's our regional rep here with a nice cast going there. And they had a pretty good uh, uh, gathering here. Uh, they had uh, women from all over the state and Connecticut uh, show up there and it looked like a really good time was had by all. Actually, I saw Dean and Lisa both on the uh, Zoom calls here. So uh, uh, that was, uh, it was really great. And let's see, yeah, that's all the pictures I put in. So um, uh, just um, kind of where we are at with the chapter, we have about 230 members or so. Uh, we did put our Facebook group on pause. Now, if anyone wants to volunteer to uh, start a new one, uh, let me know. Um, but um, uh, we're not doing it at the moment, but we are very active. We have our own uh, YouTube channel. And uh, this meeting we're recording, and we'll post that uh, on there tomorrow. And uh, these, we've gotten some good traction. The most popular one was the one we did in, uh, let's see, April, May, May of 2021, last year. Uh, Al Krauss did a, a profile of the Cahokton River. And the last time I looked, over 500 people have viewed that uh, meeting recording, which is pretty, pretty neat. Um, we also put our intro to fly fishing school. We did a recording of that a few years back. Um, and then our new website, uh, CanadaguaLakeTU.org, um, we're very proud of. It's about a year or so old. And uh, there's a, a contact link on there. And, and um, uh, let's see. Oh, John Gross just admitted. Game in. And um, also, we have a donation link on there. So this is the, like church where you pass the plate. <laughs> but um, if you can help our chapter out, we greatly appreciate it. We actually don't get a lot of direct support from Trout Unlimited National Group. So um, we raise a lot of money on our own. Um, but uh, anything we appreciate. Um, the past few years during COVID, when we haven't been able to meet in person, we've actually had to invest a lot in software and hardware, like the cameras here we've got. So uh, any little bit, um, I know a lot this time of year, everyone gets hit hit up for, uh, you know, give, give me money and, you know, blah, blah, blah. But um, I know and if you're already a member of TU, you get those mailings and the matching things and win a free hat. And, but uh, you know, think about it, instead of getting the free hat, why don't you help us out? <laughs> so we'd appreciate that greatly. Um, okay. Um, I just got to put some folks on mute here. Uh, there we go. And um, so let's see, upcoming meetings. Uh, our next event is December 14th. We have our holiday party right here in this room. And this is always, a, a, this will be the first time we've done that since 2019. Um, it'll be a good time. We, um, we'll have some good food. Uh, the Legion caters for us, and uh, we usually watch some funny movies and have a, a raffle or two. So uh, it's a good time on uh, December 14th. Um, January 9th, uh, we're just getting this set up, but our plans are that we're going to have an introduction to fly tying at the, excuse me, the Victor Farmington Library in, uh, in Victor, right in the village of Victor. Um, they had actually uh, approached us um, with interest um, about doing an event there, so uh, hopefully it'll be a, a it'll be a new venue for us. But um, we're pretty excited there. And then um, we're in the process of, of organizing our um, fly tying school, which uh, we haven't done in geez almost three years now. It was in 2020, in March of 2020, we had to abruptly pull the plug on it, right? in the middle. So uh, we're restarting that and uh, we'll have the details. Uh, that'll probably be in March and, or February, March, kind of like we've, we've done before. Um, might be a little shorter this year. We're talking about doing like four to six classes instead of eight, which we've done in the past. But um, um, uh, we'll announce that uh, probably pretty quickly. But for the time being, we're going to we'll have this uh, intro meeting and we'll kind of 
help people like with what how to get started with fly tying, what equipment you need, the tools you need, the materials, um, and so forth, and uh, do some demonstrations. We have a lot of really good fly tires in the chapter, and uh, the, the, um, you remember Mike, we did the class there at the same room, so it's a nice big room, and uh, uh, so looking forward to that. Uh, February, we actually are still looking for a, a program. So if anybody online wants to uh, be a guest speaker or has a good idea, uh, let us know on February 13th. And then uh, March 13th, we have a really well-known uh, guide and author, uh, Rich Kustich. Uh, he's from uh, the Buffalo area, right, uh, Ralph? Correct. Right. Okay. And he's noted for musky and for steel fishing. Okay, so that'll be... Um, also, all our meetings will be right here in this room. And then uh, we're just uh, getting this organized on April 10th. Um, we've done this in the past where we do a women's invitational meeting, uh, which was uh, very successful. And so um, actually the two ladies on line here will probably be part of it. I'm drafting them <laughs> now here, but uh, that uh, will be a, a meeting geared towards uh, women in fly fishing. Uh, which TU is doing a lot of uh, effort to recruit more women into the sport. And it's really, the, I think, it's one of the biggest opportunities we have uh, to um, increase our membership and also get more people engaged in this sport we like so much. And a lot has been done. One of our, actually, the guest speakers on, I'll uh, put her on the spot, Adina Brown, who's the New York State uh, Vice President of Diversity for um, uh, TU. Um, I uh, twisted her arm, and she'll be uh, one of our guest speakers. Uh, excellent fish, excellent angler, angler uh, Adina. Um, and then You're too May kind. Oh, no, thank you. There she is. <laughs> <laughs> I heard that part. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks for uh, joining us online tonight. Glad to be here. Uh, thank you. In May uh, 13th, we're going to do our intro to fly fishing uh, school. It's a Saturday morning at Onanda Park in, uh, on Canandaigua Lake, the shore of Canandaigua Lake. It's really a beautiful spot. And um, in fact, we actually have some alumni in our audience uh, <laughs> here from our last class. So um, we had a, a pretty good time. That's also a program we resurrected. It, uh, it's been years since we had done this class. So uh, that was actually one of my um, most fun things we did last season. Uh, June 14th, we're gonna have our uh, beginning of summer, end of season picnic uh, location. We'll figure that out. It'll be at one of our local parks. We've done it at uh, Victor Municipal Park, uh, Ontario. Ontario County Park. Uh, we did it last year on the uh, River. So, um, but stay tuned. That's always a fun event. That's a. And then in July 11th, uh, this will be our third uh, bass and panfish invitational at Bowton Park in uh, East Bloomfield, which is a <clears throat> really beautiful kind of semi-public park. Normally it's only um, accessible by residents of uh, Victor uh, East and West Bloomfield, but they gave us uh, our chapter permission to actually go in there. And it's uh, really a great place to fish from a canoe or kayak. And uh, actually has some pretty big, uh, especially really big largemouth bass in there. So. Um, that's a, a kind of our remaining season here. Uh, let's see, let's move along here. Uh, this is on my plea for volunteers. Actually, I want to really thank a couple of people, recognize uh, Ralph and Bernie for uh, really stepping up and, uh, and helping uh, and engage in, um, with in improving our membership and and uh, taking some things off my plate, which uh, I really appreciate uh, what, they've, what they've done here. Uh, as some of you know, I, in a couple of newsletters, I announced I want to retire from this post at the end of the season. So uh, Ralph and Bernie are kind of helping with that, that search, if you will, for someone I can hand the baton to. Uh, it's a little bit of a hot potato when you take on a job like this. It's like, great job. You want to do it? Nope, nope, you're doing a great job. So... Um, <laughs> Uh, some other things you can help us with are with our uh, newsletter, our tight lines, if you have photos or, um, you know, stories or links. Uh, again, I uh, recognize Adina, who's now a contributing columnist for tight lines uh, with the work that she's doing each month. So I want to thank and recognize her and, uh, and various other things. So um, 
well, actually Max and Ralph helped me set up tonight on the AV equipment and uh, and also our conservation programs that Ralph's now in charge of. And the one open position we have is in our veteran affairs. Um, that's our uh, project healing waters, fly fishing. Uh, we actually have an open uh, position if anyone wants to uh, volunteer to, to help with that. That was uh, something because of COVID we had to suspend um, also, we used to do it at the Canandaigua VA Center, and uh, they, a lot of the people we worked with have been, were transferred, so that kind of went up in the air, but um, hopefully we can uh, get going, because that was very meaningful um, uh, programs we worked with. We're helping with the veterans um, at the, uh, through the VA there. So if you're interested in, in or have any ideas, please uh, email me at uh, info at CanandaiguaLakeTU.org. Any ideas are, are, are great. Uh, there's a volunteer organization, so um, it only is successful as the, the effort that you know folks put into it. Uh, let's see, Ralph, here's a couple of blurbs for you if you want to yak here for a while. So, <laughs> um, okay, the most recent uh, Just down there in front of them. <laughs> the, the most recent uh, conservation there. projects that we have taken place in is uh, the uh, the crossroad project was finished up in July for the structures, which we put nine in over about 1,700 feet. Uh, that was done. Grass was planted. It looked great, but we had 50 trees to plant. And because of how hot the dry the summer was, we waited till I think it was October 8th. And we had that motley group, including myself, that <laughs> showed up and helped uh, plant uh, uh, 50 trees. And afterwards, we had a bit of a, a barbecue and some laughs and fun for all. So that's that's done and complete. Uh, it's going to be interesting. Hopefully, now with this rain, the waters come up and we can see uh, how that's really working. It's, it's the water is was minuscule. The other thing we did uh, in August is install a Mayfly unit, which uh, measures temperature of the stream, which is critical for us to have a better understanding of the environment overall on the Cohocton. The only problem is on about uh, October 28th, some critter, we think it was a muskrat, came and bit the sensor <laughs> off right where the cable entered the sensor, so it's not repairable. Uh, that being said, uh, we've uh, I've ordered a new sensor, and I've, uh, I have received a cage about nine inches in diameter, and it's got some really thick steel mesh around it that uh, it's a it's a product that was used in barns by farmers who put candles in it. So it's really pretty rugged. We're going to I've got a little work to do on inverting it and we'll use it and no no beaver and no muskrat is going to be able to get at <laughs> this. So we've got that fixed. But right now, if you go, you're going to see the temperature is like 1700, some, minus 17. I don't even know what that is. It's flat line. <laughs> so it's no good. Uh, with some luck, we will get that replaced uh, before the ice and, and the snow comes uh, and have it back up and running. So that's kind of where we are. No real uh, solid plans for next year at this point. I think we're going to be doing more maintenance on the trees we've planted over the last 10 years. Uh, replacing some of them, and um, uh, there may be an opportunity right in Cohocton itself where they've replaced the bridge. I want to talk to uh, Pete Osterman about that, and then lastly, you'll find out more when I do my presentation later. All right, thanks, Rob. So that's one of the things our chapter is really well known for is um, is our conservation work. The Cohocton River is. Um, our chapter's uh, priority water uh, is the, the designation that TU has given it. And so we're kind of the stewards of that, that river. And um, uh, we do a lot of things there. We stock a lot of trout. Was it 15,000 trout we stocked in there this season? So um, um, we'll be planning to do that probably next April and March. Um, in fact, a number of uh, students from uh, Marcus Whitman School has, have helped us with uh, stocking in the past there. That and I think Cohocton School District also. Um, okay, uh, let's see. Next uh, slide, I think we we'll get to our main programs here. And uh, the first one we're going to talk about is our, like I said, our first ever Trout in the Classroom 
so I'll give a little bit of background how this all came together, and then I'll uh, let our uh, our guest speakers have the floor. But um, over this summer, I got an email uh, from uh, John Pragel, who's the uh, I think environmental science is the the class you teach at. Yeah. Fine. Okay. And uh, who was interested in the program and had, had uh, found out about it, I guess, through TU's website. And um, this is a really neat program. It's uh, where um, uh, basically you raise trout from eggs. Um, and I'd always wanted to get involved with this, but uh, we hadn't, you know, with all the other things going on, we just hadn't had anyone to have the bandwidth to, um, to work on it. But um, so um, this was actually our first opportunity to. And then coincidentally, about a week after John contacted me, I got another email from a uh, gentleman named uh, Brian Forsberg, who's also a teacher. He's at uh, Whalen Central School. And Brian um, had just moved into our territory. He previously lived in the uh, Elmira area. And he had run trout in the classroom at um, uh, Ernie Davis Academy, which is, I think, the high school down, one of the high schools in the Elmira area. And very enthusiastic about it. So um, uh, early September, uh, John, Brian, and myself had a Zoom call to say, okay, let's see if we can make this happen. And it was a really tight uh, time frame because the, um, <clears throat> you're, uh, you're using uh, brown trout, which uh, spawn and hatch in the fall. And so we had about uh, maybe a month <laughs> to get our act together to see if we could uh, get this up and running. And, um, and so the biggest, uh, hurdle and biggest uh, expense was what's called the aquarium chiller, which is uh, we have a picture of it coming up here. Which basically is like a big refrigerator unit that uh, has to keep the water at 57 degrees. You have to have it really cold, and and so you needed a pretty heavy duty piece of gear. And um, TU had a website where if you want to get into the program, they had a supplier that you could order this stuff from. But long story short, they were back ordered because of supply chain issues and you couldn't find a chiller through the usual TU link. So Brian took it upon himself to basically go search the internet and very quickly came back with a shopping list of this is what we need. And he found a supplier in uh, Illinois that um, uh, had chillers in stock and they were actually $300 cheaper than uh, what TU was gonna sell it to us for, or to use vendor. So I, I ordered that and, and some other equipment. It got express shipped to us. And uh, by the end of September, we I think early October, we had all the hardware installed that we needed. And then, um, then the next step is uh, we had to pick up the trout eggs. And so I ran down to the bath fish hatchery in uh, early October and uh, had this precious cargo in a mason jar and ran it up to the school in that afternoon. Um, uh, Jason, Jason or Josh? I'm sorry, Josh, right? <laughs> okay. Um, you can see him uh, putting the eggs in the uh, in the chiller there. So let me um, turn off my screen and then uh, pick up the other um, presentation that uh, was sent to us. And uh, you guys have the floor now, so come on up and. <laughs> so this is a uh, yeah, come on up. Just uh, we'll move the camera around and uh, just hit the um, page down or barrel down. All right. <laughs> Um, yeah, so. we'll, uh, yeah, we yeah. Got Hi, everybody. so I'm John Pragel. Uh, I teach at Marcus Stillman Central School District. Um, this is Heather Dimple, so she's my co-teacher in almost all my classes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we've got a, a good mix here. So I teach uh, Living Environment, which is a ninth grade class generally. Uh, Gemini Environmental Science is a college level environmental science class, and then Earth Science as well. So with me, I have... Um, Three environmental science students and two living environments in the any earth science. So I'll let them introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Megan Gang, and I'm in environmental science class. Junior. I'm Olga Hoover, and I'm also in the environmental science class. I'm Maddie Crow, and I'm also in the environmental science class. I'm Josh Stay, and I'm in the environmental science class. Oh, thanks, Josh. Thank you. All right, so these are all our kids, and Gordon did a pretty good job giving the background here. Um, so. 
So uh, this is uh, Gordon dropping off the equipment as we get it set up. Um, and so the tank was actually donated by a former student of mine along with the filter. So this big filter right here is another pretty big expense. Uh, but luckily I had a, a student last year that had a turtle that she had raised. Uh, and so we nursed that back to health and then released it at FLTC. And so the mother donated the filter to us. Um, and so with that idea, I thought, well, what a great time to get into uh, Trout in the Classroom now. And like I said, I emailed Gordon and luckily Brian had helped out as well. Um, so getting it set up, uh, I'm going to let uh, yeah. Mrs. Dimple do a little because she did most a lot of learning with this part. I did. Really this is all new to me. So it has been a lot of fun to learn along with the students. But Gordon has been a great help. So he came the day that the chiller was installed and we installed that. I went to Naples Creek to gather some creek water and to get some of the good bacteria that was in the creek so we could get the tank established for the pre-cycle. A few pebbles from the creek too. Um, yeah, so that's how we started and then had the students testing the water before we got the eggs actually to make sure that every the ammonia and the nitrates and everything. Yeah, you need about two to three weeks to pre-cycle the entire tank to be ready to put fish in. So we luckily the timeline worked out almost perfectly to get that yeah. going. The thing on the left, if you go back to it, yeah, that's a chiller. That was the big thing. Yeah, drive. that's a chiller. Um, <laughs> I had an updated presentation of the new picture, but basically what happens is we have a pump over here that pumps the water in and it goes through. We set it to 57 degrees Fahrenheit and then it kicks it back out through another tube. Um, and we have it kind of set up so the entire tank kind of moves from this side to that side. And so it's almost resembles the stream. We found that we had to alter it a little bit because when we started feeding them, it, it was really strong and they couldn't make their way up to the top to eat. Mm -hmm. So we've messed with the hose a couple of times to get to where we want. All right. Curtis. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So the chiller keeps the water at the right temperature so then they survive. And the bubbler, we need it for the dissolved oxygen because if they don't have enough or too much. Um, obviously you need clean water. So that's what the filter does. And the rocks resemble the bottom of the stream in Naples Creek. Yeah, I learned a lot about all that chemistry of the, uh, the stream that you had to, you know, regulate. You know, they had ammonia and all the dissolved oxygen. Thank you. That was good. There's sure. my mason jar. That was <laughs> <laughs> um, this is before we release them. Uh, they just, uh, the brown trout and their eggs, they have not hatched yet. They're, and they're what, second stage or third stage? So when Gordon dropped these off, um, at first we were like, oh, there's not very many in there. And as they started hatching, we realized there's somewhere between 150 and 200 eggs. <laughs> um, and you said when you went to pick them up, they just kind of like let you scoop them, right? Or like have at it. Yeah, I think I was supposed to get a, a hundred or something like that. And, you know, so you had this little net and I'm like, oh, well, <laughs> make sure we can. <laughs> yeah, you can't really, they're, they're tiny. <laughs> oh, where, um, where did they come from? The bath hatchery. Bath hatchery. Yeah. And when were they when were they fertilized? Oh, let's see. Probably late September or what was the day? It was about the eighth of October or something. I'd have to look back. Yeah. yeah. It was early October. They were actually starting to hatch. Some of them were uh, starting to flit around there. So, yeah. so uh, it was that was one of the critical things about the timing of it. Is, uh, if we were going to do that this year, we had to get all that hardware up and running, and then um, and then go run down and get the actual eggs. <laughs> um, we had a little container hooked onto the side so they could just stay in there and they wouldn't like get sucked up into like the the filter and everything else. Um, and so they could like they could get used to the water. So they uh, didn't like get crushed from the rocks so like you couldn't see them. And so we could examine them. Or uh, we had a, a booklet that we had to draw in and like examine them. Yeah, so here you can see this. This is the setup. This is the tube right here. 
And so that's taking in water from this side into the chiller and then kicking it back out across. And at this point, we had it cross the top here so that the water would go into that little breeding tank and to get some water moving over top of it. Um, this is where when they started the hatch, we discovered that they could fall down and go through the bottom of that little container. And so at first we thought they were just disappearing. And then we started finding them among the bottom of the rocks. So when we got those rocks from Maple Creek, basically they were kind of burrow themselves down into the little rock and hide until they hatched. So we went from where we thought they had 200 down to thought we had 20 back to now we back up to about, I think 150 uh, roughly. It's hard to estimate. <laughs> It'll stand still. They don't. Josh was in charge of um, trying to capture them and put them back in. And uh, he had a lot of fun doing that. <laughs> so with Brian's help, um, at first we were like really cautious with these things, thinking like we want to make sure they survive. And he emphasized, he's been doing it for a long time, they're educational. Like we're not repopulating brown trout in the Finger Lakes area. We're meant mm -hmm. to learn. And so with that, we kind of got a little more adventurous and started removing them as they're hatching them. And, and we put them underneath a stereoscope with a Wi-Fi camera. So this is an, you know what this is called, the stage? Uh, it's uh, the egg. Uh, I don't know what stage it is, but I know it's like yeah, that's really Alvin. the Alvin stage. Alvin stage. Um, so it's really cool to get this picture of a yolk sack. I don't know how to put a video into PowerPoint, but we have a video of when its heart starts pumping. You can really see the heart pumping. And that was really, really cool. I don't know if you wanted to add anything for that. I really got into seeing it. It was hard to just like get them to be still at first when you put them in this area because they're so, you know. Um, but yeah, once once they got them still and could see the heart pumping, it was just like, oh, <laughs> kids got into it. So from uh, the biology aspect of this is where we talked about a little bit about development and um, different life cycles. Um, and then one of our freshmen actually found this yeah. one day. Uh, so this is a conjoined twin. Obviously, the yolk sacs are connected. And for a little bit, it was moving around. We reached out to the DEC, and they said, they see this um, a fair amount, not a lot, but a fair amount, and they almost never survive. And so we've since lost it. But it was like every day we'd come in and hunt for it and try <laughs> to find it. And uh, we don't know where it is now. It's probably been decomposed down there. Um, to get to the environmental side a little bit, Maddie, you want to sure. talk here? So we've been making regular journal, journal entries about like the different stages they've gone through. Like in the first one, you can see how like they're still small and they have the yolk sac, so they're still in the Alvin stage. But then, like, as it, it went further, like, time went along, we drew them again when they turned into the fry stage. What? No, we'll just, just like, because you're yeah, up next so, to yeah. right. We've also been running lots of weekly tests just to make sure that the, uh, the tank itself is at its prime and the fish are thriving in the tank. Um, we're testing tomorrow, actually, uh, water quality at the Penyon uh, wastewater treatment plant. So it kind of goes hand in hand. You know, we've had like hands on practice testing water, and it's just been a really awesome experience being able to test all of um, all the qualities of the water that we have. Yeah, and from my side, I've, we've taught about dissolved oxygen for a really long time, and it's cool for the kids to be able to just actually take water out of the tank and see that it's usually around 10 or 11 parts per million right in the tank. And so when we go compare to the stream, we'll be, you know, need to say, okay, put a brown trout in here. Did the uh, water in the tank come from a stream? So we put about yeah. five gallons in the stream. As after that, we can add tap water. Our tap water comes out at a pH about 7.6, and so that's relatively neutral for our fish. Uh, we do add a water conditioner to it when we do a water change, just to get rid of any chlorine, fluorine, or anything like that. We have, as you guys know, really healthy water around here, and our tap water is among some of the best. So we're not concerned about putting it in. The only thing that we concern is we can't do more than 10 to 20 percent change or the temperature will change pretty significantly especially if you turn on the hot water that is on saturday <laughs> so on the cold water um so that was a little bit of a uh step back um do we have any problems with the bucket the ph has been changed right we don't have a buffering thing 
We haven't. No, we have the the um, filter itself. There are pads you can put in to okay. buffer it. We also um, can add a buffer to it if we want. But our pH has been at seven point six since we put the tank yeah. in. Yeah. 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 It's been a change at all. Yeah. Six, all the time. Yeah. Okay. The ammonia comes from what the base of the fish. It's funny you should ask that, <laughs> Maddie. <laughs> so, we have a diagram of the nitrogen cycle in our closed tank system and how it shows how we feed the fish food and that turns into ammonium from their waste. And we do test for that regularly in case there becomes too much. We don't want bacteria to build up and to kill them off. So we test for that to make sure it's always at a safe level. So that's the bacteria that is the part of the meal that's free. The ammonia comes from the fish waste, also comes from overfeeding. And so it's really hard to not overfeed them at this stage. So we're constantly testing. Um, and just to kind of make what Owen had said as well, we're doing the same exact test on the creek tomorrow at uh, Creek Outlet with uh, Nadia Harbo actually coming to get that. Mm -hmm. So um, she's pretty fun. Oh, I was switching to Yeah, you kind of you gotta make it good when we don't have too much space. So we're also focusing on like how it is easy to like incorporate our lessons with this because most of our lessons are all around water as of right now and doing all this testing and stuff is also going to impact our field trip tomorrow that we're having as Owen and Mr. Fraggle mentioned. It's very like useful for world real world interaction with some of the stuff that we're doing in there and it's also easier to have like a um open minded like um ideas and like coming up with like just listening to all the stuff that we're learning, it's easier to understand as you have something to like use an example of and when you honestly do it with something. So I also found that also great about having this here. Um, yeah, no water testing is pretty good. Um, so the, the last thing I want to add is we said, wouldn't it be really cool if we could log in and watch them at any point in time? And so we have a really supportive tech department. So like, Pitched this idea to a guy, and about a week later, a webcam showed up at my door. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so um, with a couple of phone calls to both these, our tech department ended up setting us up with a live YouTube feed to our camera or to our tank that you guys can log in whenever you want and watch it. Um, we found we sent out to our, our school. So this is right now in our classroom. We stuck the therm I put the thermometer in there because yeah. I put the hot water in there, and so I wanted to check it from home so it stayed cool for multiple hours. Um, but those are all of our trout in there. We set it up to the entire school. We found that a lot of teachers were just putting it on their board as their background. So YouTube has a lot of these, uh, you know, you can like do things landscapes that people will put on. Yeah, cause so put this on. Yeah, the cause class over at Bosey's, the cosmetology class has now become very fond of putting this on their pictures. Yeah, really, yeah. Well they do their uh, pictures. Is, <laughs> this is as simple as trying to get water sound. Water sound. Yeah, that's what I said if you just open another tab. Like, yeah. So can we, we can log into this? Anybody yeah. in the world can click and log into that. Um, so, so the live stream that goes continuously through YouTube. I put a link uh, to this in our Newsletter reminder sent out Friday. They don't want to look at that. So I mean, I'm sure it has a few seconds different. We'll probably add it to our website too. Yeah, feel free to. I, yeah. I got. I wanted to make sure just to add permission. We put the background up there. Two things. One, it, it took the reflection on, but also no kid can put their face there. We can't live stream any kids' faces. But <laughs> because of that, you, anybody can play it in the world. So we're trying to reach a million subscribers with the YouTube thing, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the other cool part is this plant in the back. We didn't plant that, so that's from the stream. That's uh, Elodia, which is a native aquatic aquatic plant to the Finger Lakes. So it's really healthy, and so that started growing. Um, okay. We want to. I think we should put a mark in the back to see how tall it is. Yeah, that'd be pretty cool. So it's Naples Creek where you got some water from. The yeah. Okay. All right, great. So you can buy the bacteria to put in the tank, or you need two different things. Classy and not biased. So, how big are they now? Uh, yeah, give or take. Some of them are a little bigger than the others. Okay. Some of them kind of yogurt. Some of them look bigger. Some of them look bigger. I like a lot of egg whites now. So, are they like uh, these fry? Is that yeah. the next step? Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. And they started eating, so we have. What we did know was that we thought we got food um, with <laughs> the fish, but they didn't give us food. So luckily, again, we have a really supportive yeah, district. Yeah. We sent a couple emails out and, and they mailed us a bunch of food. Um, 
and the district picks up the tab, which is really nice. Because you have to buy new food every year. Crazy so right now they're eating it's like a powder. Pretty soon they'll graduate to a small granule, and then they'll be at a larger granule the rest of the year. Um, how big would they grow to? And, um, they'll be so. This is a this is the trout and geology. They'll be about this last stage when they release them. Just to, to pass it around. Um, I have a okay. six year old. I have a six year old Florida land year old, but they all come in rushing in to see the fish. And I tried to get her to come with me tonight, but she had a breakdown. She remember having a six year old. <laughs> um, but she'll go in there. They're here, then they're going to be here, then they're going to be here. So, you know, the little learners. Uh, you know, uh, right. Somebody made it to the flag. It's hard to tell. I don't like standing still for us. Um, I, I would say there's at least 100 in there. Not all of those, yeah, not all of those are going to survive. So, what's going to happen is some of them just won't eat. A good percentage of them just will never eat and they'll die. And then eventually they're going to start competing for some space. And so there could be some, you know, bad blood in there. I would guess that we'll end up with somewhere between 30 and 50 to actually release. But that's another great lesson in biology is in the stream, how, I don't know how many eggs a trout would have, but a really small percentage of them are going to survive. How many eggs a trout would have? Yeah. Yeah. What's that, Maddie? Trout are our strategy species. They are our strategy species, which means what? That they have lots of babies, but not expect them a lot to survive. Mm -hmm. Versus humans are okay, strategy species. Mm -hmm. A couple, but a lot of eggs. Thank God. One thing I learned just this year is that um, the male fish will actually eat the eggs of a competing. Oh, sure. Oh, wow. uh, you know, yeah, just to kind of. What, you won't do that with me? So right, keep, keep their DNA from the past. Yeah, exactly. So it's not even just the food necessarily, it's just to destroy their rivals. Okay. So it's pretty, uh, it's a jungle. Right here. <laughs> 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 I'm kind of interested in, interested in the filtration you're using. Is it, does it include like aerobic, like a uh, prickling filter or anything like that, or is it completely self contained? It's self contained, it's a canister, a canister where the water comes in, you know, go through the bottom. And it goes through lots of stages. Do you monkey with this? Or is that yeah, Jay yeah. Too, right? Yeah. Yeah. So these guys can answer probably more questions than I have, but it's a multi stage filter. Um, do you want to talk about it before? And I'll add anything in there. Because these guys have changed the charcoal in it and it's it's it all about the bottom stage, like more or less like uh, uh, rocks and like uh, minerals, and so like takes away the bacteria, the bad bacteria, and like these are the good ones. And then there's like charcoal stage. And I think there's like three or four different stages you have to do. And then there's like sponges and stuff like that. <laughs> it's like fine. If it smells like dirt, it's good, but if it smells like cheese, it's uh, uh, bad bacteria. <laughs> 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 they freak out. You smell it. You're like, you can smell it. It's like dirt or cheese. You know? <laughs> Good. Um, so, yeah, what Jeff's saying there's the bottom container is basically a whole bunch of just open surface area to harbor good bacteria. And so, that's the first stage going through. And there's a couple of just fine filters as well to take out any larger particles or you know, dead fish at this point. And then the top is charcoal. So, that'll remove the ammonia and kind of cleanse the water, just like a filter out, like a Brita filter, basically, at the very top. <laughs> But to answer your question, it's, it's aerobic. Um, it's actually the reason work. Any other right. questions for these guys? Has this been enjoyable? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Every, yeah. Every morning when I walk in there, I set my bag down and I go, it's fish. Check your fish. <laughs> yeah. And then I walk off. Small sampling of the kids come in all the time, but the fish, other teachers come in with the fish, so. Not to mention the people who like the live cam, which isn't even people at our school, too. <laughs> it is cool, yeah, I click to see there's like 11 people watching our live feed. Yeah, I know like who they are, but you know, they're, they're, watching. they're out there watching. Yeah. Little group at midnight. What's that? How many days is that? Is it like the age of how many days is that? Who put the eggs in, what did you say, October? It was early October. It was early October. Uh, Let's see. Oh man, it was so close to my birthday because I remember that October first was so close to my birthday. That's what I remember because it was like six weeks. Yeah, it's about six weeks. Um, they were at the Alvin stage for what about a week and a half. That stage went really quick. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. 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 October 12th. That's 12th. when we uh, yeah. Yeah. deliver the eggs. So. Yeah, so it's not even just a little over a month. So uh, they, they've already gotten that big. So <laughs> yeah, and so we'll release them um, <laughs> with the same release that will go. I think we'll bring them with us if we can. If okay. We release the Boston River. Uh, the DC has to approve that, but I don't see why they have to approve them. Um, the, they'll be too small to really compare to the others that you yeah. release. But we won't keep them for the summer. They'll all run the tank. And yeah. The fish we stock are like a year old, right? They, uh, yeah, year and two years. They're about yeah. six to eight inches. Paper, paper. Some are eight to ten inches. But yeah, a two year old could be 14 to 15. Yeah, the two year old fish are about a, over a foot long. Yeah. So, um, so but, we want to thank you guys for yeah. supporting that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you, you for that. Uh, yeah. No, it was, uh, really, yeah. Well, well so, yeah. Brian Forsberg's been fantastic. I'm sick right now. He was going to zoom in. Uh, but he's been, I have a cell phone number, texting questions throughout the day, and um, he's been doing it for a number of years. He's got a tank as well. Yeah. Doesn't have a webcam yet. Uh, but as I was telling some of you guys, yeah. it's kind of already spread. So a teacher in Penny Ann has set up her tank already. She's getting her fish soon, and she's trying to get a webcam as well. Um, Wayland has one. I thought it somebody else. I know the teacher in Prattsburg is looking for one as well. Mm -hmm. And so it's spreading. And there's, a there's a lot of them in the area. Ithaca area, the TU chapter over there is. I think they have 25 <laughs> tanks in that. Uh, so it's a, uh, so as you know, we're going forward, we'll try to, uh, you know, uh, maybe each year at a school or, cause it is, a, we'll have to put it in our budget if we're going to uh, keep supporting the project. Cause it is kind of a big, big knot. To, <laughs> the big like, investment next yeah. year, we won't have to personally decide the food in the school pick up that tab. So that's yeah. Great. Yeah. Yeah, so it's really not uh, kind of once you do the initial investment, uh, oh, it kind of just yeah. runs on its own afterwards, and that you just need to <clears throat> coordinate the, the egg pickups and things. But how many subscribers do you have? If you minimize oh, that, uh, forty-one last time. I started well, out. You're that, close to that, yeah. Yeah, yeah we're 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 in there. there. Two will have like. Two <laughs> that might be my mom. <laughs> yeah, so I've been sending it to everybody that I know. Um, we're looking for sponsors in the back, right? For, um, Maybe you should pound minister that link over both these. Yeah. He'll just go through the tech department, which will be okay. You should just go through that view. Um, yeah, so, and thanks for these kids coming out on Monday night at 30. Thanks for having Yeah, well, thanks a lot. It's, uh, it's, really, it's been a lot of fun uh, for us, to, especially. Uh, I really enjoyed this. Okay. Yeah, get some uh, donuts and stuff, and so. Um, so let's go to our. Uh, so after uh, that, now Ralph is going to depress the hell out of. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, this is actually a really important uh, topic that he has. Um, the one thing, actually, Ralph and I learned, uh, we went to the bath um, hatchery last week, and the brown trout are actually downstream, like in all the tanks where they raise the fish. The brown trout are on the uh, kind of the last tank of fish because they're uh, more resilient, they're hardier. Fish. can handle the dirtiest of the water. Right, so the dirtiest water goes into the brown trout tanks. And, and the I think freshest, the, I think, goes to the brook trout. Brook trout right. and lake trout get the, mm -hmm. the, and then the rainbows. But it's funny how they have them all segmented. It's a fascinating place. It's a great uh, field trip. All right, so let's see. You're up for off roll. <laughs> I'll find the truck. <laughs> <laughs> I can't see everybody that's on Zoom, but uh, those of you that fish here in the room, I'd like you to raise your hand if if you feel like there's not as many insects and the hatches aren't as big as they used to be. So that's that's a pretty that's a pretty much universal thing. So they all have COVID. <laughs> well, it's probably worse than that. Just click and then hit the click the. The down arrow? I hit that. No. There we go. Okay. 
So I guess the, the question is, what's happened to our hatches, you know? Um, the DEC stocks, it, uh, it, it uh, tells you there's more or less, they've had a big change in the way they're monitoring and managing trout streams, trying to make it simpler on us all. But what's frustrating is that uh, nobody ever looks at water quality. So you know why why are we seeing less insects? You're not seeing the bugs plastered on the front of your car the way we used to. You know, I remember when I was a kid, it was like dad would send me out with a you know with a pail of water and a scrub brush. So it's, it's just not just not seeing that. So um, so when we start asking that question, the questions go on from there. It's where are the insects gone? What's happened to our hatches? I can't believe that you haven't seen something that's come in your mailbox that says, what's happened to the bees or what's happened to the monarch butterflies? In fact, the bird populations have plummeted in the last 10 years by uh, several billion. You know? So what do birds eat, by the way? Insects, you know? Same thing's happening to bats. You know? So the question is then, what's happening in our streams? And is the same thing affecting our soup, uh, our food supply? And that's where are the fish? Not what you think it is. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> the question is, uh, it, it came to me. I uh, most of this presentation comes from a a fellow by the name of uh, Mike Miller. Uh, Mike Miller is with the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources and. Uh, he did uh, this presentation for the folks in the driftless zone in Wisconsin. And uh, I guess this is another thing for the environmental class in, uh, in high school. The driftless zone is an area in Wisconsin that was not touched. It's actually southwestern Wisconsin, northeastern Iowa, eastern Minnesota. And it's an area where the glaciers came down but they didn't touch this area so the other places have got what they call drift in the rock formations in this area has no drift so they call it the driftless that's a little aside but anyway this uh, particular guy did a this uh, uh, mike miller did this presentation for the tu and the driftless zone uh, over a year ago uh, they had a two-day uh, web-based zoom-based uh, conclave, and he gave this. I need to give him a lot of credit for a lot of what's what's in here. Um, so, um, so <laughs> what I'm going to tell you: the 800-pound gorilla in a room is something called neonicotinoids, and we're going to talk to you about what it is, its uses, and what the risks are regarding this particular compound. You know, neonics, what are they? Um, neonicotinoids are a synthetic form of nicotine, and they are uh, all there. <laughs> and they uh, create this synthetic uh, nic neonicotinoids, and I'm going to call them neonics because it's a lot easier to pronounce from here on out. But uh, they they get them from tobacco plants and tomatoes and potatoes, which are all part of um, uh, some kind of a, a strain of plant that that has this the stuff that they can get the secretion out of. But um, what it is, it's a neurotoxin, and it disrupts the nervous system, and so it it binds to the neuroreceptors of uh, the insects. Um, disrupting communication that makes them kind of makes them die ultimately but they they muscles can't react the way they should and so on um, and all the various strains and there are probably 500 plus products that have this neonicotinoid uh, synthetic nicotine in them that have similar modes of how they how they react with uh, with insects and what's interesting is they're much more uh, toxic to insects uh, or invertebrates than they are to vertebrates. So they're not as toxic to humans uh, or uh, mammals as a whole, but they are uh, very toxic to, and we'll see how badly toxic they are to uh, particularly aquatic insects in a, in a minute. Uh, what happened to me is 
I was watching this. I will. Okay. <laughs> I was watching this presentation, uh, not live, but uh, it was recorded. And I started thinking about all these things about, geez, I've been getting all this stuff on bee colony collapse and monarch butterflies and the, the birds and so on and so forth. And I finally said, bingo, you know, I think this guy is onto something. So what are the use of these neocontinoids or neonics? Well, the biggest, one of the biggest uses of this in seed dressing. So what do I mean by seed dressing? They take the corn seeds and the soybean seeds and they soak them in this stuff or spray them. I don't know how they apply it, but they coat these seeds in the neonics uh, and then they plant it. And the idea is that the uh, pesticide becomes a um, systemic inhibitor to the insects. We'll talk about how, 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 how that actually works and how effective it really is. They have foliar sprays, which means you spray it whether they got canteens and they go around or they get a, an airplane or however they do that. They've got granulated, much like you would spread fertilizer on your lawn, they can do it that way. They can do root trenches. Um, they can use baits. In fact, they've used baits on uh, trying to, uh, to prevent the ash borer. So they'll put these like nails of this stuff into a tree and in theory it will kill the ash borer certainly hasn't worked around this part of the country, but um, we'll see. Uh, they have topical versions of this. How many people in the room have a dog? <laughs> Do you put flea and tick stuff on their, a uh, topical flea and tick thing on their back? Guess what's in that? We'll, we'll, we'll visit that in a minute. So nearly 100% of off field corn and most of those soybean seeds are coated with these neonicotinoids. Uh, they require no, uh, nothing from the farmer to monitor the fields to find out whether in fact they've got aphids or, or other pests that they need to kill, uh, but it's an insurance policy. It's a prophylactic solution where, okay, I've done this now, I don't have to worry about uh, these insects and pests. Like I said, it's a prophylactic, uh, uh, use of these pesticides. But the problem with that is it's given way to some bad practices. Uh, farmers don't rotate crops as much. Uh, they don't monitor for pests because I've done this. We've already taken care of those pests because we we planted these given seeds. Um, they don't like say, okay, instead of doing the prophylactic version, we're going to uh, treat when necessary. Geez, I went out in my field today and I'm starting to see aphids. Let's go and spray. No, that's not what they're doing. They're planting this with the with this pesticide already in, in, ingrained, no pun intended. Um, so they do this to avoid persistent chemicals, but in fact, you'll find out that these chemicals are persistent. So the first use of neonicotinoids was, uh, it was in 1993. They first started selling it in 1993. In the next few, few slides, you're gonna see a time series, uh, not till total current time, but it's only grown, and, uh, but you're gonna see what's happened. So this is in, in 1995. We go to the year 2000, 2005. And I think you can see where uh, Western New York, where we are, is in this picture and there's 2010 that's that's our part of the country right up there right along the lake it goes down you know even down to where the cohocton is and you all have been driving around here you see how much corn and soybean crops we have it's here and there's 2015 it's even worse so you know they don't have as much corn production out west so you don't see it but the midwest which is you know the, the Corn Belt. Corn Belt <laughs> is, is where you see it. So they've done some tests as to how effective um, these compounds are with respect to yields, because what you're trying to do is make sure you have a high yield of whatever corn you produce. I mean, they, the farmers do this for a reason. They do it to grow grow crops and the more that they can, more bushels of corn per acre that they can produce, the better. But what they have found 
is that in the vast majority of cases, there is no change, none. In fact, the only place where it might, uh, they found that it might make some sense to do it would be probably way south of the Mason-Dixon line where they have a much bigger uh, pest problem, it's warmer climate, and it's a better place to do those kinds of things. So the question is, why are we using all these neonicotinoids? What are some of the physical properties? I think one of the biggest problems is that it's water soluble. So we plant corn seeds, we plant them in uh, end of April and May. Uh, they get in the water, we have some rain events and uh, some, of this, uh, some of this pesticides goes up systemically five to 10%, the other 80 to 90% washes off and gets in the groundwater and ultimately goes to the stream. And you may have always also seen in our area, and I'm sure in a lot of other areas, farmers are now doing a practice called tiling. Tiling puts drain tiles in the, in, in the fields, much like you put a French drain around your house to keep put the water from going into the basement. Well, they do that so when they get huge water events, it flushes the water and you don't have a big, muddy, uh, nasty field. Well, that just helps the water that's filled with the runoff that's, that's, that has content of, of these pesticides, along with, I might add, other nutrients and, and uh, um, other chemicals that go into the streams. So the other thing is that this has a long half-life. What's that mean? It breaks down very slowly and it, um, and it adds up. It's, uh, it, it continues to add time and time again. So they could have as long as a 6,000 day half-life, which is close to 20 years. So I think that the uh, data for this was not available for the later years, but you can just see the kind of increase in use uh, that this, these kind of chemicals have had. Most of the yellow one, that was? Yes. Yeah. Vegetables and fruit. Yeah. yeah. So here's kind of what happens. You plant the plants or you plant the seeds, they start to grow and slowly but surely, you know, the, the, uh, this pesticide goes up in the, into the plant from a systemic point of view, but then wears off. And then by the time actually the aphids arrive, oh, by the way, it's kind of worn off and all the rest of this 80 to 90% is washed off and is, is in the groundwater. The other thing is, the same chemical that kills the aphids also kills the pests, the, the uh, predators of these aphids and other, uh, uh, other uh, problem insects that the farmers have. So, you know, fly away, fly away, ladybug, uh, it also kills the ladybugs that eat, uh, eat these aphids, which is what you're seeing there. Let's talk a little bit about this, uh, uh, the risk from an environmental point of view. Again, we were talking earlier, I mentioned earlier about bee colony collapse, and it, we're seeing that everywhere. Um, LD50 is the lethal dose, that's the LD, of half of a population, 50%. And so, um, in a bee colony, the lethal dose for 50% for an individual is, I know we were talking about millions, you know, parts per million in your testing. We're gonna get way lower than that in a minute here, but five billionths of a gram is enough to have a lethal dose for uh, half the individuals. It is 100,000 times more toxic than DDT. Now, I don't know that everybody in this room is old enough to uh, remember that, but when I was a kid, you guys, when I was a kid your age, I grew up in, uh, in a suburb of Northern Chicago. They used to come along and they fogged the neighborhood. If you were smart, you went inside, but they fogged the neighborhood. And uh, uh, so 
after a while, yes, there were far less mosquitoes, but you also didn't see any more lightning bugs, you know, and I used to like to collect lightning bugs, put them in a jar and put them in my room and have a light show in my room, but that's, you don't see that many lightning bugs anymore, and that's because of DDT. DDT was finally uh, outlawed, and it's no longer available for use. So just that gives you an understanding how lethal this stuff is, but I've got a few more here first. A sugar granule, a single granule, this is kind of a blown up version of this, is enough to kill 125,000 bees. Just let that rest for a minute. 125,000 bees with one grain of sugar, okay? Okay, that isn't enough. We all go to the diner, you get a sugar packet, you put it in whatever it is you want to put it in. That's about three grams. That's enough to kill 600 million bees. 500 products containing neonics are registered in New York. The number of tons of neonics applied, there are many tons applied in, in this state. Now I took some, some numbers by the guy who did this and kind of translated it to New York. But if, uh, if you do one milligram of, uh, per, for uh, neocons per corn seed and there are 30,000 seeds per acre and it could be as many as 60, um, you're gonna end up with, if you start doing the math with the number of acres that we have in the state, you're gonna come up with 27 tons of this stuff are put on our fields annually just by planting corn without any other, other use. Now here's where the rubber meets the road. When they tested this stuff, they tested it against mammals and said it's not very toxic. And they tested it against something called water fleas. Well, water fleas are pretty resistant to this. Um, but uh, the insects that we need for the trout, uh, the, the mayflies, the caddisflies, and the stoneflies are many times uh, more vulnerable to this than are uh, these water fleas. And in fact, if you're at 35 to 199 parts per trillion, it's a chronic condition. And this where these, these insects will lose their, their motor skills. They don't know where to go back to their burrows and so on and so forth. And over 200 parts per trillion, and we're talking tiny, tiny amounts. It's, it's lethal, okay? So um, I actually tested for this uh, in the Iwaka Creek this summer. And uh, I had some direction from U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and they suggested a, a uh, lab in Ontario, Canada that I could go to, and it was the closest to, to Rochester. So I went and did that. And uh, the first time they sent me back the information, they said, well, uh, we can't we didn't see anything. So I had them tested again. And the bottom line was that they couldn't get down below five parts per billion. And five parts per billion, you might as well kiss the stream goodbye because you know that's way, way too much. So what we're think I'm thinking about for this chapter for uh, when I talked to the folks down at Twin Tiers Five Rivers in Corning last Monday, um, belong to a club in on the Waka Creek. We're talking about doing this and doing some uh, some sampling, but through this Mike Miller and a lady at the at Wayne State University where they can test down to uh, these levels, we're gonna talk about doing some testing for the coming year. So it's not only agriculture. I talked about your dogs before. The topical uh, treatments where you separate the hair and back of the neck and you squeeze a few drops and let it sink in, that's also water soluble. And if you let your dog uh, have a lot of fun and jump in the creek or the lake, guess what? It's water soluble, that goes away too. And the recommended monthly dose for a medium sized dog, by the way, is enough to kill 60 million bees. So you might ask, what's government doing about this, you know? Why haven't I heard about this? Well, the main reason you haven't heard about it is probably because the agrochemical uh, industrial complex, which is, is one of the biggest, if not the biggest lobby we have in this country. And they spend a lot of money. They give a lot of money to our politicians. And so um, 
I'm going to skip kind of to the to the uh, somewhere in here. Uh, well, the New York DEC will restrict the residential use, which is tiny nothing. <laughs> As of the first of the year, the DEC said, "Oh well, we'll we're going to do this." But in fact, the New York State Legislature in 2021 had a bill to restrict the use of neonics, and it, like many other things, kind of just fell by the wayside. The U.S. Department of Agriculture seems to recognize that it might be a problem, but so we just ask the farmers to be responsible about it, you know, um, whatever that really means. Uh, Trout Unlimited published an article, um, but it has no real action plan either. Uh, the European Union, however, has outlawed its use in total with a caveat that if you're a farmer and you say, hey, I got aphids, I need to use neonics, they let them go use it. So it's not totally out. So uh, just so you know, the honey you buy at the store doesn't have a lot, but it has neonicotinoids in it. So uh, it's not going to bother uh, mammals or vertebrates, so you're probably in no real danger. But in the food you're eating, you're starting to get it as well. Um, so you might ask, what can we do about this? Well, hopefully I'm doing one thing. I'm helping to educate people, but you might talk to other people once you learn something about this. Um, so it's personal awareness. It's uh, letting the others know and educate them. Uh, testing. And uh, I know I'm speaking in part to the, uh, some high school students, and I'm not expecting uh, money to go test, but I'm expecting this chapter to invest in it and some other entities, hopefully the, the TU chapter in Rochester, a couple clubs on the Iwaka, the folks down at uh, Twin Tiers to support some testing, which is not going to be super expensive. Um, probably all in, uh, we're talking about $60 a sample, so, as opposed to the $500 we spent this summer on a single one. So, and then once we get some data, some hard data, then it's time to start time to start making some noise. And uh, I think I think we're way overdue to start making some noise about this. It's the that's the way DDT got taken care of. It's the way you know they finally did something about uh, nicotine and there are a lot of other topics we could talk about. So what about these new nicotinoids? They're widely used. They're used more on a prophylactic basis. The economic uh, benefit is questionable. Uh, they don't, they're not getting greater yields in most cases. It's accumulized, uh, accumulated year after year upon use. It's mobilizing water and acute, uh, we have acute and chronic concentration in aquatic environments. And I maintain to you that that's why you're seeing smaller patches and less bugs. This so is helping, uh, like create riparian barriers around streams. Does that not really absorb any of these. I, you know, it probably slows it down, Gordon. Okay. But ultimately, where's the water go? Yeah, <laughs> it keeps going. You know, uh, so that, that's you know, they have found. There's a book that I'm going to show here in a minute. Uh, that'd be great reading for for high school, by the way. <laughs> I'll show this the next. Um, that where they didn't spray or give any. Um, uh, of these uh, neonicotinoid pesticides to um, hedgerows in, in Europe. They might have done the field, but they didn't do it anywhere else. They tested the pollen uh, and the nectar from flowers, wildflowers in these hedgerows, and they were full of it. So to your, to your yeah. question, it just flows through. This is an article that was published in, uh, in Trout Magazine. Uh, uh, I don't know, six months ago, something like that. And it talks about it. That's the sum total of what TU has done. Um, you can go to their tu.org and you can go to their magazine uh, area and, and go down and you can find this. It's not, it's not hard to find. I, I could have brought this book, but it's called Silent Earth, Averting the Insect Apocalypse. It's a fascinating book. Uh, there's a whole chapter, of, of maybe the longest chapter in the book is on neonicotinoids, but it talks about a lot of other things from fungicides and, and other chemicals being put on, on our uh, agriculture that are affecting the insects in 
we need insects. You know, we need insects to feed. It's part of the food chain, you know, and ultimately we, we need them. Well, so many of our foods depend on pollination. This is what's never made any sense there. Why would you kill the insects that are pollinating food we eat and are critical? And um, <clears throat> it just seems like one hand is chopping off to the other here or something. I believe in China, actually, in their agriculture, they have very little natural um, pollination. Like humans have to hand pollinate, like fruit trees and things, because they don't have enough bees um, to uh, do it now because of pesticide use. So, I mean, that's crazy. <laughs> you got a little insect, I'll do it for you. And, yeah. So, uh, are there any questions? I'm now that I've thoroughly depressed it, Maki. <laughs> Has there been any research done as to how to impact phytoplankton and zooplankton populations? Done what? How it impacts phytoplankton and zooplankton populations? You know, I honestly don't know. I, there have been there have been studies done, even in New York. Um, I think a couple of them were on here um, mentioned, uh, you know, footnote kind of thing. Uh, I've not seen anything at that low a level of, uh, but certainly with with the with, with the um, macroinvertebrates that we need for successful uh, habitat for trout. The uh, <clears throat> zebra mussel is really a question. Yeah. 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 You're right because they filter it out. Mm -hmm. Yes. Are there um, any certified labs that are testing this? I know that DEP really prefers to use certified test results. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, it's it's difficult. And, and, and I know I'm going to run into this as a buzzsaw, but I talked to the folks at Cornell. Cornell can't test, test down to parts per trillion for this. You know, so there are very few labs. And, and I know that Mike, uh, Miller and this lady from Wayne State who runs the lab up there, they use a filtering process yeah. or a pre-filtering process to do something. And I, I'm not a scientist and I don't totally understand it. What I do understand is that hey, they have a process uh, and we have a lab that can actually tell us there's something there. Now, what, what happens then is if they don't like who did it or how they did it, then it's no good. I get that. Okay. But we got to start someplace, and I can't start with somebody that can't get down to uh, below five parts per billion when I need five parts per trillion. You know, it just doesn't compute. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just a question of terminology, Ralph. You use the term synthetic nicotine. Right. But to me, synthetic means you take some basic chemicals and put them together. But yet, this is a natural product of certain plants. Is that correct? It's uh, It comes from the nightshade family of plants, and they extract it some way, and, uh, uh, you know, it's going to have to ask Bayer how yeah. to do it and what it's about, which I don't think I'll tell okay, you. Okay, so it really may be a, a synthesized right. process. Correct. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Who are the companies you mentioned? Bayer. Well, Bayer is uh, probably the biggest one, and then there's one other one that escapes my mind at the moment. Monsanto, or no, that's not Monsanto for okay. change. So is it? Is it? You said most of it is around the seed pod when they plant it, or is it genetically modified, or is it just being wrapped in? It's wrapped in. It's just dipped or something. I don't. You know, I don't. I can't tell you. I don't know the exact process, but it's coated. So whether they dip it in or spray it or however. Maybe with a little paintbrush, they paint the yeah. <laughs> like like uh, uh, orange paint when you yeah, plant. Yeah. 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 All colors. Right. That's that's the stuff. That's the stuff. Don't don't chew on one. <laughs> don't pop it. Although it's I'll not spoke it's not <laughs> it's not supposed to hurt us vertebrates, you know. Find <laughs> that hard to believe. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what? Yeah, it's interesting yeah. when you find yeah. things about testing, um, you know, something that I've seen in doing more testing is you can find a list of these things. Yeah, that'd be great. Because they do a lot of, they have the course of basically water testing. Well, I need, I, I need to raise about 2000 to $2,500. If we want to do a, a, a good sampling on Awatka and on Cohocton and maybe Cuyuta. 
that Kiyuta based the, the Twin Tiers folks, you know, that's a favorite of theirs. So there's there's a you know the first uh, fixed amount has to do with uh, a little vials and uh, syringes and filters that you need to get to do this process, and then there's a, a certain amount that you need to do because you need to keep this stuff ice cold or frozen to get it to the lab, which is in Detroit. And then it's 50 bucks a sample unless their prices go up. So that's the pricing. It's not, it's, this is not rocket science. It's, it, that's what it is. Is organic uh, seeds and things, is that one of the possible solutions? Uh, I, mean, I assume they, they're not allowed to dip this. <laughs> I, any kind of it, you know, I don't know, but the vast majority of seeds, Gordon, are done just like this. They buy them from yeah. whatever it is, agri right, yeah, or whatever. Cow uh, corn. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, right. So it's, it's either for, you know, stuff for silage or stuff for ethanol or whatever. And that's part of the growth in this is the growth in ethanol is the growth of corn. So we got more corn with more pesticides on it to go release more of this stuff into the water table. <laughs> so it's, un, it's, it's most likely in underground aquifers that are in this area and certainly it flows into the streams. And if you ever fish in Kalakin, of course, you know you're surrounded in that valley by, you know, farm after farm after farm and the walk through farm fields to get to the stream. But, uh, <clears throat> but anything as consumers we can do other than, I mean, we can't use it residentially. But, well, uh, <laughs> I I support um, a an organization called the National Resource Defense Fund, NR. DF NRDC, yeah. or NRDC, one of the, these guys, uh, one of their biggest focal points is on these neonicotinoids. Oh, okay. That's good. So, you know, you can, you can, when you get these uh, solicitations from, <laughs> from a variety of places, you know, uh, you know, you can, you can support somebody that wants to uh, save the uh, polar bears or you can look at something that wants to say bees and and <laughs> uh, and are looking at these neonicotinoids. I mean, it's it's uh, that book that I put forward is something that uh, if if you're science and biology teachers, uh, I heartily recommend it as a read. And once you read it, you might think that either in part or in total, something for some of your classroom stuff would be be good. All right. Any other questions? Any questions online? Uh, no. Anyone chat or um, put anything there? Doesn't look like it. But... No, no chats. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Ralph. That was uh, really good. All right, that's our, our program for tonight. Thanks everyone who uh, attended here and also who uh, uh, came on Zoom. Uh, had a really good turnout for us tonight. So I'm really happy with uh, the group we had and uh, also seeing some folks we haven't seen in a while So uh, and some new folks. So that's that's great news. So, um, so next time, uh, December, we'll be back in the room here. We'll, we'll be uh, having our Christmas party um, and uh, I'm going to sign off. Let me, uh, let's see, Lisa Green uh, sent a chat. Great presentations. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Lisa. So, um, okay. So, good night, everyone. Uh, I'm going to do one thing with the Zoom, and that's the, let's see. No, first I have to stop the uh, record. There we go.